pray to God this goes this goes. All right, let's see. I'm gonna check. Usually I like to give a little bit of a, a second for people to log in. And in case we have any technical issues, um, they can let us know. Um, let's see. Because I always see uh, administrative view. If anyone's logging in, um, if you could let us know, if you can see us or hear us. And we'll just make sure that's all working before uh, before we go too far. Perfect. Um, yeah, trying to remember. So it looks like, uh, yeah, it looks like we got thumbs up from Jessica coming in loud and clear. Awesome, thanks, Jessica. Uh, looks like we got a couple of viewers, which is awesome. Um, so we'll give it. I'll give it one more minute um, before we get officially started here. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, the, the two of us that are with us right now, uh, this is uh, the first time we have Facebook live streamed through uh, an alternative third party app. So this is our first time doing it. So if uh, any of the audio or anything like that comes in weird, please let us know uh, and we'll do our best to fix it. Uh, and hopefully this all goes through. Yeah, we just got a couple more people. so. Um, I think we're probably pretty good to get going. Um, so welcome all those who are joining us live. My name is Don Labar. I'm the Department Head of Special Collections at the Alpena County Georgia and Fletcher Public Library. A um, bit of a mouthful, but I'm getting used to saying it now more and more as I, as I continue my months going in. Um, today we're being joined by Brandon Schroeder. He is a, an educator. Hopefully I'm getting this right. You are a senior extension educator with Northeast District and um, education co-leader with the uh, MSU Extension and the Michigan Sea Grant. Um, today's presentation is uh, based off of Brandon Schroeder's and Dan O'Keefe's article that they did for the Historical Society of Michigan. Um, and that one was titled uh, Small Fry and Big Catches, the Great Lakes Fishery. Um, it was an article that was done just recently, correct, Brandon? Yep, yep. Awesome, yeah. So th if you're interested in seeing his article, uh, if you're subscribed to the Historical Society of Michigan, uh, you should be able to see that magazine. Um, we do here at uh, Special Collections, we do get their magazines. We're currently closed at the time, uh, but when we do reopen, which is hopefully going to be in the, the next month or so, uh, we will be able to share that uh, with anybody who would like to read more about it. But today's presentation is based off the article. So I'll, uh, I'll let you take the wheel, Brandon, and then just kind of introduce yourself, and then we'll share a screen and, and uh, go from there. Yeah, thank you, Don, for that uh, kind introduction. I am going to attempt to share my screen. Yep. And then um, you should be seeing a presentation and presentation view. Yep, I'm seeing it on my end. Fantastic. Well, I'll jump in. And Don, um, as I work through the presentation and you're monitoring the, uh, you know, the live stream, Chad, if there's questions or comments, please feel free to pass them along. And I'm super excited to be here this afternoon to chat about Great Lakes fisheries um, through the lens of our past, a little bit of our present and thinking into the future. And just to acknowledge uh, my co-author with the Michigan history piece, uh, Dan O'Keefe, who's not with us tonight, but I'm hopefully going to make him proud in, in sharing uh, this overview. So a little bit about us. Uh, so again, my name is Brandon Schroeder, and I work with the Michigan Sea Grant College Program. Uh, which is a, in Michigan State University Extension. Michigan Sea Grant is a um, program of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and every coastal uh, state in the United States has a Sea Grant program in Michigan, including our freshwater seas, the Great Lakes. In Michigan, that uh, program is administered as a unique partnership between the uh, University of Michigan and Michigan State University, uh, specifically through our extension program. And so uh, we have offices in East Lansing and Ann Arbor, but we also serve in, in coastal communities. And you'll see uh, my, my office and location is the, the red dot there in Alpena and in Northern Lake Huron. And so Michigan Sea Grant, you know, really our focus is promoting and supporting uh, ocean science and research, or in our case, our freshwater seas, Great Lakes science and research. And then uh, working with our coastal communities to think about how we use or sometimes generate 
uh, science uh, and knowledge through research to not only take care of our Great Lakes because we know these freshwater seas are invaluable, but really think about how we interact with them in, in social and economically and environmentally uh, friendly ways. And so uh, we're really a, re a non-regulatory program, really a research program, really saying how do we use uh, science and research to uh, take care of these Great Lakes resources because they're, they're, they're valuable to us. And I, I would say, uh, uh, Michigan State University and the Michigan Sea Grant uh, program, uh, no and so forth. We we really have made a commitment to um, civ the civil rights commitment, and a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and and so just making a note that all of our educational resources and work is open to anyone and everyone for any any reason at all. So hopefully, in what I'm sharing tonight, if you see opportunities to to pass the word, we're happy to share our information and resources and support wherever helpful in the context of the Great Lakes. So for the rest of uh, you know this afternoon, I really wanna focus on, on this fisheries and I'm pretty proud of a couple uh, projects that I've uh, been a part of. And the first is um, the uh, Michigan Sea Grant publication, The Life of the Lakes, A Guide to the Great Lakes Fishery, which was just newly released uh, this year in, in the fourth edition uh, through our Michigan uh, Sea Grant program in partnership with uh, the University of Michigan uh, press. And so uh, a lot of what I would like to share uh, today is, is framed in um, the outline and format and structure of, of this uh, publication. And hopefully uh, you might look into it as a, as a resource for additional research and reading if you if anything I shared it today perks, perks your interest. And then as Don mentioned, we did um, out of the Life of the Lakes um, have an opportunity to uh, published this small fry and big catches piece with the Historical Society of Michigan and their Michigan History uh, magazine, which was a, a really neat way to uh, bring uh, focus to the historical and heritage aspects of our Great Lakes fishery and in particularly in a context of, of Michigan's uh, Great Lakes fishery. So uh, again, another hopefully great read, uh, encourage you to pick it up and obviously won't be sharing all of uh, the, the full breadth of the content we hope to, to uh, pass along in those publications, but hopefully uh, can share some highlights uh, that might uh, that you might find interesting. And so I, I always, I like to start, whether I'm working in education or coastal tourism or, or fisheries, really start to, I like to start with a celebration of our, our Great Lakes and our freshwater seas, and just recognizing how really amazingly cool these resources are and how rich uh, we are to be in Michigan to be at the heart of, of these uh, Great Lakes. Five of nine of the largest uh, lakes, on, freshwater lakes on, on earth, um, more than 11,000 miles of shoreline and 20% in, in our Great Lakes, 20% of the world's uh, freshwater available to, to us on the surface of this planet. That's pretty, pretty significant. And to put it in context, sharing an image from my uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant colleagues, I, I, I love this. When you think of our Great Lakes, uh, people recognize our coastal oceans and recognize that the Chesapeake Bay or Puget Sound are, are really significant watersheds and water systems. But then to think that Puget Sound uh, fits entirely within Lake Huron or Chesapeake Bay uh, could be swallowed up by Lake Michigan, just to show uh, that size and significance and really recognizing that these are resources that we can see from space, right? These are really significant freshwater resources. So fish uh, in the life of the lakes is really celebrating, uh, you know, the Great Lakes fisheries that are a part of these freshwater ecosystems. And in the life of the lakes publication, we really try to look at those fisheries uh, from a, a variety of angles, looking at not just the ecology and management of those fisheries, but um, our fisheries as we know them today. Uh, diving back into history to think about our history and heritage and how history has, has framed the fisheries we know today, and then looking into the future really through the lens of issues uh, and opportunities. Um, so I'm going to break the rest of this talk up into those chapters, if you will, and, and start uh, with a quick look at ecology and management. And in this in this chapter in the life of the lakes, I'm not going to cover all of this, but you're thinking of our fish and ecosystems. You're thinking of management concepts and, and institutional arrangements. Uh, and then we we spend a lot of time in in these lake profiles, looking at fisheries in the context of each individual lake. Lake Superior is very different than Lake Erie and Lake Huron, different than Lake Ontario, and really trying to look at how those fisheries differ or compare to the different uh, among the different Great Lakes. And so I, 
um, again, always like to think that um, we're really rich in these uh, Great Lakes fisheries resources. Nearly 180 species call the Great Lakes uh, waterways of the Great Lakes Basin home. And I, I like this piece by uh, Dr. Abigail Lynch and Dr. Bill Taylor, um, who really frame the values of, of these fisheries resources. And um, if you're a recreational angler, you know that fishing can be fun. Uh, we also know that sometimes uh, fish can be a food source and uh, a tasty walleye on the plate is, is great, but we also have this tremendous um, uh, commercial fishery bringing food in out of the Great Lakes. Uh, we, we know these um, uh, fish are extremely valuable from an economic standpoint, and we know that they uh, provide a significant ecological function. So uh, Dr. Lynch and Dr. Taylor really say these are the four F's of fish, uh, fun, food, financial values, and, and, and ecological function. And I think you can probably relate to that. I, I have this poster from uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant of our Great Lakes fishes, just some of them. And if you start to name them, you're going to immediately think of those fish that um, are meaningful to us, the fish that are good to eat, uh, the fish that are fun to catch. Uh, but we often forget about that larger ecosystem scale and, and forget about the, the diversity of over 50 species of minnows, for example, or darters, or, which are a smaller relative of the perch and walleye family, or any number of the, the smaller fish that uh, fit into different um, aspects of the uh, Great Lakes uh, food web from a fishery standpoint. So really excited to say that 180 species of fish really gives us a diverse and dynamic fishery to, to benefit and value. And again, uh, just thinking about how um, all of these species are interacting with each other from a food web uh, standpoint is pretty significant because that not only helps us to think about the big fish at the end of our line, but also the little fish uh, that are a part of that food chain at lower food uh, food levels, but then also what are they eating, right? So then all of the, the macro invertebrates or microscopic plankton, whether it's zoo or animal plankton or phyto or plant plankton, all of those uh, living organisms in the food web become instantly important to um, those fisheries that we have now found have now described a value in right so uh, just thinking about how important um, that functioning food web is and uh, the context of putting fish into our our daily lives and i like to think of the great lakes uh, you know if you think of them as, as these oceans you really recognize that there's a, a wide variety of ecosystems and habitats in the great lakes and so you could think of some of the near shore uh, fisheries, you might equate to things like bass or perch fishing, vegetation, you can see the bottom. Uh, but in our Great Lakes, you can also think about those deeper offshore waters and you can think about the benthic zones in the deepest parts of Lake Superior or Lake Huron, but also those pelagic zones, the upper water column where you have fish uh, free swimming, uh, such as uh, salmon in the open offshore waters. And I, I like to think that there's diversity in our fish species because fish are designed to take advantage of different types of habitats. For example, a Chinook salmon is a better pelagic offshore fish than a, a pumpkin seed or smallmouth bass that may be more interested in nearshore waters. But really thinking about the context of life cycles, recognizing that, that these, these um, habitats are interconnected too. So a uh, salmon uh, river, uh, uh, river habitat is just as important to a spawning salmon as that offshore habitat. And there's a lot of um, interactions between these ecosystems through feeding and, and reproduction cycles and so forth. And then again, uh, this is a image, a couple of images from our, our life of the lakes. Uh, thinking about it from an ecological standpoint, at simplest terms, you're thinking of fish, uh, like any living organism, as, as really having three jobs in life, right? Survival, not dying, uh, living long enough to grow to, to grow, and so you're having food and enough uh, resources to, to grow to maturity, and then once achieving maturity, being able to successfully reproduce. And, and when you can achieve those three jobs, you have a reproducing, uh, you know, you have a, a functioning population out there that becomes um, uh, a part of the ecosystem. So then you have all of these different species intermingling. And then from a management and use standpoint, we start to say, how are these fish uh, being being removed from the system. So some of that is is natural reproduction. Some of that is the ecosystem interaction, but a lot of it or, or a significant part of it is also our human interaction in terms of fishing, um, uh, whether it be commercial or recreational fishing. fishing. So thinking about the management 
uh, the ecological aspects of what makes a fishery and then how people interact with that fishery is something um, that we like to spell out in this publication. And just for fun, um, I, I, I like this pu this publication, this image here, the food pyramid image that Dan, Dr. Dan O'Keefe helped to put together, really just asking ourselves, what does it take to make 10 pounds of Chinook salmon in the Great Lakes? And if you follow that down through that functioning food web, you see that 7,500 pounds of phytoplankton or plant microscopic plant plankton are needed to create that fish that we're excited to have at the end of our line. So a quick scan, that's a quick scan through our ecological sort of thinking of the fishery. And now I wanna tie people in. And really most of the rest of this is, is how, how do we intersect, intersect with this fishery? And so that today's chapter of the Great Lakes Fishery really looks at the many values and benefits uh, of our fishery, whether it be recreational or commercial, charter fisheries, tribal fisheries, aquaculture, the many different ways that people intersect with this fishery. And if you think about it, um, there's a tremendous amount of ways that people access water and a tremendous amount of ways that people uh, deploy, even today, deploy fishing gear to catch fish for a variety of reasons, whether it's fly fishing or boat fishing, river fishing, um, commercial fishing off, off a commercial vessel, uh, fishing from docks. Fishing uh, is so much a part of many people's lives and the way people fish is widely varied. And our, our sport fishery um, really from a Great Lakes standpoint represents about 1.8 million anglers that are accessing specifically the Great Lakes fisheries across the Great Lakes region. And you'll see not only is that a fun fishery, but that drives also some economy, uh, close to 500 charter, um, probably a little less than that now, but close to 500 charter captains in the Michigan charter boat industry. And we know that uh, this fishery uh, from a wide uh, lens and that regional lens is worth be somewhere between four to seven billion uh, dollars annually. And our commercial fishery, uh, sometimes in the shadows uh, of the recreational fishery, but still significant and important, annually and sustainably harvests, harvests over uh, 41 million pounds uh, of fish. A primary fish that you might recognize uh, from the restaurant standpoint is, is the Great Lakes whitefish. And again, um, I'm going to start to think. Um, Michigan history and diving back into history, I like to, to look backwards and maybe this is not a linear image, uh, so I don't want you to think of it this way, but really thinking that through time, um, people have always looked to the Great Lakes and fish migrating into rivers to spawn or coming near shore to spawn, um, have really looked to our waterways as a source of food, whether that is early uh, seine fishing, or a pond net fishing to, you know, maybe more modern day trap net fishing and our recreational fisheries are, are not even uh, represented here. This is more of a commercial uh, look through our Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage uh, Trail site. Commercial, I should say commercial or subsistence. And so uh, this is maybe um, uh, thinking uh, pre-European, um, you know, those fisheries were, have always been uh, critically important to our, our tribal nations and and, um, and you think when Europeans first arrive on the Great Lakes scene, a lot of what Europeans learned about the value in a ways of accessing uh, Great Lakes fisheries were, were largely learned from the tribal nations who were heavily reliant on those fisheries. And I like, I like this postcard uh, from the Alpina Library Collection be, because it really shows the intersection of, of uh, tribal nations and, and European um, cultures coming together, but it really frames in, and this is up in the St. Mary's River, frames in the, the value and the significance of those fisheries. This is a St. Mary's River, and again, these would be spawning uh, fish coming into the river to spawn, but easily targeted once in the river, and in, in, in here the tribal um, tribal nations, uh, along with Europeans, are, are there together netting, netting fish. Uh, Moving through time, uh, you know, with sailing uh, came uh, opportunities to harness the wind to pursue fish. 
maybe into farther reaches or deeper water. Uh, the Mackinac boat uh, in the bottom right is iconic to the Great Lakes uh, region. And I've heard many refer to the Mackinac boat as the pickup truck of its day. Really, what is the Mackinac boat for? It's for anything that you need to have hauled from here to there. Um, there's some neat research that really shows the intersection and, and of the, the, the boat designs, the Mackinac designs, again, showing how the tribal nations and the European nations uh, both have uh, significant influence on the, on the Great Lakes designs of the Mackinac boat. Mac this design known around the world, but the Great Lakes Mackinac boat having some unique designs because of that cultural exchange. But Mackinac boats were largely again, used to not only haul fish uh, after the fur trade waned, Mackinac boats maybe were used to ship uh, their their, their water-based pickup trucks where, where uh, furs were no longer being hauled, uh, shifted their emphasis to maybe hauling uh, fish to markets. Uh, and this is an example of a, of a, of a pound net or a, a, a pond net, however you might call it, uh, depending on where you're at in a region, uh, and here's a Mackinac boat dipping fish from a from a pond from a pond net. Uh, and here's a better example of a pond net. Pond nets weren't exclusively fished by uh, um, Mackinac boats. Here's an open uh, deck boat. It, it might have been a rowboat. Uh, the Bernice uh, down at uh, Sturgeon Point Lighthouse is uh, another open. Deck, a motorized vessel. Uh, both of these vessels in this image are, are used to fish pond nets. The pond net image below is really, if you think of it like a corral, uh, that long um, lead, if you can see my cursor here, is used to guide fish hit that wall and, and guide into these um, funnel traps where they eventually get caught in this pot or pond. The boats are then, um, you know, check the nets. Uh, they have these fish har harnessed in this little corral and are able to dip uh, fish out of those nets. And so, you know, thinking of uh, largely like like herring um, and then later after the invasive smelt, uh, rainbow smelt were introduced, maybe smelt, uh, a lot of those uh, fish would have been harvested from pond nets. Uh, with engines moving from sail, uh, technology from sail to, to uh, motorized, uh, we see this another iconic vessel design, uh, um, very Great Lakes in origin is the, the turtleback uh, gillnet tug. Uh, this is a design which allowed uh, fishermen to not only steam farther, but that closed deck design allowed them to be out in some of the harshest, coldest uh, uh, weather and uh, uh, winter conditions that the lakes could offer. And a lot of these vessels, a lot of the historic images show these vessels actually like going up on the ice, bucking the ice, breaking the ice to get uh, to and from from their, their fishing grounds. But the gillnet tug would fish this gillnet uh, type, uh, not a very simple fishing gear, but effective fishing gear, uh, really a panel uh, of um, a netting that's deployed in a, in a straight row. The fish would swim into these nets and as the name suggests, get gilled in the nets and then are e easily are retrieved in these. And, and, and you don't need a lot of these would be also retrieved on smaller vessels also, but the gillnet tug is the iconic commercial fishing vessel that would, would fish gillnet tugs historically and still today. And then uh, uh, this is more reflective of the, the state of Michigan's um, regulated fisheries, which are largely trap net fisheries. Trap net fisheries are, are fish from these larger open deck uh, platforms. And um, again, motorized, larger access, but the trap nets um, can be fished in deeper waters, a little pretty similar to pond or pound nets, except for that they can be fished underwater. They have closed um, pots and those pots uh, with these a little, um, a little stronger engine capacity and motor capacity are able to retrieve these nets. And the, the significance of the trap net design is that these fish um, are caught live, retrieved live, and you're able to then sort fish. So you'll see in the fish boxes here, uh, largely white fish, and those are fish that are allocated largely to commercial fisheries and um, largely to commercial fisheries and, and what would be regulated as recreational fish can be released alive. And then if you think of recreational fishing today, um, I, I, I kind of chuckle that this is maybe the Henry Ford style of one boat and on everybody's trailer behind everybody's uh, vehicle in their, in their front, in their garage or front driveway. And so uh, boating is much more accessible to a broader public, uh, whether it's uh, individual uh, walleye boats or bass boats or up, up top right is a, a charter boat. that's a, a business boat, but again, 
uh, more mass produced boats means more people on the water. And I think what's significant about these fish, the boats and the people fishing is as they tell a story of Michigan's Great Lakes fishery history and heritage. But a lot of what I, I shared to you looking back into how people have fished over time um, is reflective of our fishery still today, right? So we all recognize this significant and valuable recreational fishery, but also uh, recognizing that we have an active, vibrant, sustainable uh, commercial fishery uh, fishing alongside these recreational anglers. And I would say that um, I didn't put this section in the history section uh, because a lot of the, those methods, again, not in a linear manner, and think of this like vehicles, um, there's a lot of your classes of vehicles still on the road today. So a lot of those fishing methods from seine nets to uh, gill nut tugs to trap nut tugs uh, are still deployed as, as fishing, um, fishing methods today. So I'm gonna change gears and I, I kind of dabbled in history a little bit there and dive back into history. And in the history section of the life of the lakes, we lo really look at this as a, as a timeline um, and think about how the fishery has changed over time. But in this section also ask yourself, what are the influences that drove those changes in our fisheries? Ecological changes, social changes, economic changes, or even uh, changes in technology. And I think uh, one of the significant changes um, was the on onset of, of commercial Great Lakes commercial fishing. And, um, you know, people have, have fished the Great Lakes since people have inhabited the Great Lakes region. Uh, but with Europeans um, coming to the Great Lakes region in the, in the 1800s, uh, thinking of the timber industries and the fur trade industries, um, a, a third industry that really came out of, of Europeans exploring the Great Lakes region is commercial fishing. A lot of the knowledge uh, learned from the tribes was deployed to catch more and more fish and use gear um, more effectively and to, to target fish in, uh, uh, more effectively. And by the turn of the century coming into the 1900s, uh, commercial fishery in the Great Lakes were peaking close to 150 million pounds of Great Lakes fish harvested annually. And that's uh, significant, uh, but it was not sustainable uh, for certain. And um, I show this graph from of whitefish in Lake Michigan. It really shows uh, by the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, as most of the fish stocks being targeted were in, in a pretty steep uh, collapse. Um, at the same time, uh, in the early 1900s, we had some invasive species like rainbow smelt being introduced to the region. A lot of evidence that rainbow smelt had significant ecosystem interactions. So you have um, over harvest on, on the, the top end of the fishery and you have some underlying ecological ecosystem changes driving a uh, change in that fishery. But commercial fishing uh, remained steady, although depressed uh, through the mid uh, 1900s. And in fact, uh, you know, during World War II, the Great Lakes uh, commercial fisheries were deemed an essential service. Um, you know, the US uh, yeah, military was uh, making the rounds to coastal communities, encouraging people to fish for the war effort. and and even the state of Michigan was really uh, pushing a uh, fishing license to try to, to uh, sustain, sustain that harvest. Uh, but, but by the 1960s, that collapse was, was near complete and, and really fishing um, was, was sidelined for all intents and purposes. And there's some other things happening here. So I, I say uh, there's a, a lot of great books about uh, uh, the ruin and, and recovery of the Great Lakes. And I, I think just if you think about it, about it from logging or, or commercial fishing, uh, you know, we may, may have just gotten a little carried away. Uh, there were other, again, underlying factors, water quality degradation. Uh, some of that was driven by the, by the timber industry, for example. So you have these important uh, river systems that were largely or critically important for many um, species of fish that would move out of the Great Lakes into the rivers to spawn for spawning in nursery areas. Uh, but without the tree and canopy cover, you start to lose uh, nutrition and you start to lose uh, thermal or temperature cover from those rivers and those rivers start to become un uninhabitable. And more, um, maybe more importantly was the sand pollution. Uh, without vegetation on the land, you get more and more erosion and th that erosion fills in um, the gravel beds of rivers, which also further 
um, eliminate spawning spawning habitat. A lot of species using those gravel areas for spawning. So uh, an, a, a flagship uh, species lost from Michigan or um, extirpated from Michigan is the is the Arctic grayling. Uh, uh, the um, grayling was a species of char. It's in the, the salmon and trout family. It's most closely related to a fish, uh, you know, the lake, lake trout, which is also a char or the brook trout. And uh, that species requires um, highly cold water uh, and uh, really um, undisturbed uh, river systems. And so when water warms up in a river, you lose uh, species like this that are um, tied to uh, specific water quality constraints. And of course, um, you know, we have, have uh, factories um, springing up along the waterway. And why? Because if you could produce products in mass, and then the Great Lakes were an important uh, commercial highway for shipping goods to and from, from the Great Lakes region. But again, um, the, the um, degradation that comes with factories and, um, and, and the, the waste discharges into the lakes was, was pretty devastating to the Great Lakes ecosystems. <clears throat> and then habitat loss. Um, lots of uh, documentation of, of Michigan's wetlands, uh, significant loss of Michigan wetlands. Uh, being filled in and um, um, utilized. Uh, and I, I look at dams. Dams are, are a number one uh, challenge for, for Great Lakes fisheries because dams create separation uh, from the Great Lakes to their inland inland water habitats. And then other things along the Great Lakes like shoreline uh, stabilization and, and, and so forth. So habitat loss was significant. Uh, and then I, I think if, if, if you were to ask me, I, I always kind of think of aquatic invasive species as maybe being the most uh, detrimental um, to our Great Lakes um, ecosystems. Um, sand, I, I, I described as pollution, as maybe a physical pollution. We know chemicals and oil spills are not good for the Great Lakes, but those are, are pollutions that plausibly can be remediated or, or cleaned up. Aquatic invasive species are species that move in and are able to take over and create significant ecological and economic harm through that invasion. But what's important about that is they're biological. So these are living um, organisms that are also doing that job of life, surviving, um, growing to maturity and reproducing, but their invasive characteristics, and there's several examples I'll share, um, allow them to do that in a highly effective way where they're able to really take advantage of, of the ecosystem that they're invading. So in the mid 1900s, uh, 1920s through the 1960s, let's say as a time window, the two most significant game changers in the Great Lakes ecosystem was maybe, was surely the, the invasive sea lamprey and, and the alewife. So the sea lamprey uh, was able to invade the Great Lakes um, through the creation of um, the Welland and Erie Canal. Those canals designed to circumnavigate uh, the, the Niagara Falls so we could ship in and out of the region, but that allowed these um, otherwise poor jumpers, they're not gonna jump over Niagara Falls, uh, these poor jumpers to invade uh, into, into the Great Lakes region. And with lake trout, which was the predominant predator um, in our um, offshore Great Lakes waters, uh, lake, lake trout and burbit, burbit uh, were the two uh, primary dominant predators and really the only top um, top food web predators in the Great Lakes at the time uh, were already suppressed, already depressed because of commercial fishing and habitat degradation. And this biological invader, which, which uh, paras per serves as a parasite on fish, but in the Great Lakes was able, became more than a parasite, was killing fish as, as more of a, a more of a predatory way uh, by, by sucking blood uh, out, out of this fish and sucking enough blood that these fish were uh, not surviving, right? So that was the final nail in this coffin. You you overfish a bit, you reduce the habitat, and then you uh, add add this parasite that happens to kill its host, and you you lose you functionally lose that top predator. Without that top predator, another invasive species, the alewife, is able to invade the Great Lakes region and really explode because of that lack of top predation. So I, it was maybe an alewife party and a party where that alewife began to eat itself out of house and home, uh, you know, feeding on, on plankton until largely it had over consumed its own food source. And it's, it's, it's also at the top of its, of its uh, thermal range. So some cold winters and or lack of food are gonna cause these massive dios of alewives. So by this 
time, by the by the mid 1900s, people are really looking at dead and rotting alewives on the beach and large fish gone from the Great Lakes, um, rivers like the Cuyahoga on fire, and just saying the Great Lakes are largely are largely lost. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story um, it leads to a story of recovery. We have the, the Federal Clean Water Act, the Federal Wetlands Protection Act. The Great Lakes Fishery Commission is, is, is formed, an international um, non-binding but collaborative commission of all of the research and management agencies with this core mission of how do we deal with this sea lamprey issue. The Michigan, state of Michigan, under the, the leadership of um, Dr. Todi and Dr. Tanner, um, explored out west and looked at Pacific salmon, uh, which exclusively ate alewives as a potential inter solution to introduce uh, a solution introduced to the Great Lakes to deal with um, invasive invasive alewives. Uh, a lot of native species restoration efforts uh, get underway. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service look at lake trout restoration efforts. Uh, we see uh, restoration efforts for biodiversity, like with the lake sturgeon, and the state of Michigan today is looking at even restoring uh, possibilities of restoring grayling in, in the Great Lakes uh, River uh, waterways. And the most important thing we did is we, we said, hey, maybe we should regulate this fishery. We can harvest from this fish, fishery sustainably if we set a little bit of uh, uh, some sideboards and some rules for ourselves. So at the end of the day, investing in habitat, fish, and fishing uh, became a priority again. And I think uh, for Northeast Michigan, uh, really some neat history uh, tied to Northeast Michigan, the Hammond Bay Biological Station was at the center of a regional effort in, in collaboration with the Great Lakes Fish Commission to uh, research and really um, try to understand sea lampreys uh, leading to the effect of uh, several effective treatments that are now being deployed to keep sea lamprey populations depressed. Uh, and then, uh, so, so um, top left is, is uh, Dr. Vern Applegate uh, working at the Hammond Bay Biological Station uh, studying sea lamprey. And then top right is Dr. Howard Tanner stocking uh, Chinook salmon uh, smolts. And this is an image from his uh, book, My Great Lakes uh, Salmon Story. And uh, the Chinook is a vessel that uh, was a research vessel managed by the Department of Natural Resources until recently uh, served many, many years um, on the Great Lakes uh, studying fisheries and really looked at that horizon of time when those first, those Chinook salmon uh, smolts were first being stocked in the Great Lakes to uh, uh, some of our mo most current days. And I'll mention this again, but the Chinook is incidentally retired at the Besser Museum uh, for Northeast Michigan. And um, the new vessel replacing that vessel is named the, the RV research vessel uh, Tanner after Dr. Howard Tanner. So uh, I'm going to start to bring us to a uh, close or nearing nearing the end here, uh, I wanted to end by exploring uh, our future. And the future chapters of the Life of Lakes really looks at issues and opportunities, research and management challenges, and really encourages our thinking about that public role in our fisheries. And I say that because I, I think when you look, if when you read that chapter, chapter, what you'll see is a lot of what we're thinking as challenges or opportunities in the future are not that different from the past. For example, um, <clears throat> invasive species are, are, are an issue that's just as relevant today as it was in the early 1900s. Um, we see a new wave of invasion with zebra and quagga mussels and the invasive round goby and, and the, the, the alien looking creature here is a spiny water flea that again, um, through the uh, 1980s uh, to modern day are really reframing and restructuring our Great Lakes food webs uh, in ways that are, are not always great. And like Huron, for example, uh, these dracenid mussels and their ability to harvest plankton out of the water column are largely responsible for uh, a near collapse of the Chinook, a, a definite collapse, uh, but a, a sustained low of Chinook salmon in, in Lake Huron, for example. And uh, this is my colleague on, on the left, Dr. Dan O'Keefe. Uh, but, you know, I, I think as you look forward, we hear about um, the the silver and big head carp uh, uh, threatening invasion from the Mississippi, Mississippi waterway. And from one of my Sea Grant colleagues, this, this, I uh, shared this, you know, Nessie popping up in the Great Lakes. But this idea that um, we dealt with invasive species in the past, we're dealing with current invasions today and invasions still threaten us in the future. Um, the idea that invasive species is an issue that threads, us to, that threads together through time is worth uh, reflecting on. 
And if you look at that, um, we're nearing or maybe over now uh, over 180 species of not non-native species in, in the Great Lakes. Uh, and this is a NOAA um, Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab uh, poster. So issues looking to the future, um, again, not that different, right? Invasive species, water quality, habitat loss, climate. Um, you will note, um, and this is an image from the Nature Conservancy, I like this, but you will know that overfishing is not um, here, right? So in the rest of the world, overfishing threatens as a concern uh, for, for sustainable fisheries worldwide. One of the prides in our Great Lakes fisheries is the ability to manage a diverse uh, fishery for diverse valuable values, but in highly sustainable ways. And that comes back to the regulation, the, the um, and sometimes uh, binational uh, regulations when you think about the tribal nations involvement in the fisheries, the, the, the states, uh, the United States, the different states involvement in our fisheries, and that we share some of these fisheries with Canada. Uh, that's not a small feat to think about how do you regulate in a collaborative way to accomplish those many values, but in a, in a, in a relatively sustainable way. So overfishing, I always talk about overfishing in the Great Lakes as historic overfishing. Um, I'm going to breeze through these fairly quickly, but just recognizing that water quality and habitat, you know, historically we were talking about uh, PCBs and, and mercury, but still today we talk about water quality and habitat um, issues, dioxins, PFAS, line five in the risk of oil, um, habitat restoration. We're still talking about dams and fish passage connections. And in some uh, regions in Thunder Bay and Saginaw Bay and uh, St. Clair, Detroit River system, uh, restoring spawning reefs for fish. So these are still issues we deal with today. Climate issues, um, we know that climate issues are, uh, um, we, in, in terms, we know a lot about climate issues. We know that it's complicated and we know that these impacts are long-term. Um, probably we're on the front end of really understanding what that means uh, for the Great Lakes, but we do know that the Great Lakes are not immune. And we know that it with, a, uh, a climate warming scenario we have you know with fish ranges alone you're going to have winners and losing losers and with fish this is an image of like white fish um are there potentials uh are this this research was focused on on lake white fish looking at the importance of ice cover uh for spawning uh white fish so that ice cover providing pr protection for these fish that spawn in very near shore rocky areas if ice cover becomes less um uh less reliable on the Great Lakes are their potential for life cycle disruptions. And then I think back to regulation is maybe most important is back to the humans who intersect with this fisheries allocation of fishery resources, um, access to fisheries, recognizing diverse values, how do sport commercial aquaculture industries continue to intersect. intersect. Um, and then, you know, recognizing, thinking of the, the um, Right, the idea that right now the 1836 uh, treaty consent decree is being renegotiated uh, between the tribes of the 1836 uh, Treaty of Washington and the state of Michigan, and really asking how do those two nations uh, share a fishery uh, in the context of, of recognizing this as a changing fishery. So just really recognizing that many people use this fishery for many ways, and that a challenge is really making sure that everybody has access for those diverse values in, in sustainable ways. So um, I hope, you know, that that's sort of a run through, and I know I've, I've been a little long winded here, uh, a run through of the of the Great Lakes fisheries uh, past, present, future from, from my lens and my opportunity to be a part of the Life of the Lakes publication and the, um, and the, uh, and the Michigan history uh, small fry big catches article and excited to share that with you but I wanted to leave you with this idea of encouraging you to, to continue exploring our awesome Great Lakes fisheries. Um, I've had the great opportunity to be a part of the Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage Trail Network and Partnership which is a really awesome network and partnership of museums largely but many other partners uh, that are excited about well, excited about getting people excited about the Great Lakes through the lens of our Great Lakes fisheries history and heritage. And uh, a lot of that work started with the Besser Museum for Northeast Michigan, surrounding the stories of the Catherine V, the retired uh, gillnut tug that lives at, uh, in Alpena. 
in the Evelyn S, which is a Lake Michigan gillnet tug um, in South Haven at the Michigan Maritime Museum, really saying, how do we protect these, these artifacts from our past to, to talk about and celebrate our Great Lakes fisheries? And I wanted to share that the office, uh, Michigan um, the Eagle, the Office of the Great Lakes, and NOAA Coastal Management invested in this partnership, building an interactive Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage Trail um, Network website. Website, And I, I say that because in times of uncertainty and, and, and maybe inability to travel, this is maybe a virtual way for you to, to travel the state and the region and, and explore our Great Lakes fisheries more, more deeply. So this trail website offers uh, some themed trail stories. It shares places to visit, things to do. Uh, but exciting to me is is maybe looking into the the more more deeply into the information and uh, and resources provided under the learn more section and 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 just getting to know some of the partners involved in this work more deeply and just to bounce you around the state uh, I'll leave you with this visual is just thinking about how important our fisheries have been through time in our our different corners of the state so excuse me so here's the the Bessier Museum for Northeast Michigan home to the retired uh, Catherine V commercial gillnet tug. And um, I mentioned the, the RV Research Festival Chinook is now retired at the Bessier Museum. So you can get a little lens uh, there as they uh, undergo the development of that exhibit, uh, a lens of how fisheries research played a role in, in the recovery and, and management of our Great Lakes fisheries. Moving to South Haven is the Evelyn S and the, the gillnet tug there and a lot of great interpretation, particularly relating to the how these commercial fisheries played an important um, role in, in many of our, our wartime efforts. And her sister ship, the Bob S, uh, lives on Beaver Island, which has a really neat collection of vessels and, and fish records tied to the Beaver Island, uh, Beaver Islands, I should say. Uh, the Aloha is a, a vessel that is at Sleeping Bear Dunes, uh, a Lake Michigan gillnet tug. And Fishtown uh, is a popular destination, but a, a living uh, fishery where you can see both gillnet and trap nut tugs being actively fished today. And the West Shore Fishing Museum in, in the Western uh, Upper Peninsula is uh, probably, uh, it's entirely volunteer run, but uh, probably one of the most complete collections of, of vessels, uh, commercial vessels used through time. And so pond net boats and gillnet tugs and trap net boats are all on, on display there. And thinking of our recreational fishery, um, <clears throat> hatcheries tend to have some really great interpretation, but I show some images here from uh, Odin uh, State Fish Hatchery, which really interprets the um, rail cars and the milk uh, jugs, the milk cartons, or the milk jugs uh, that were used to transport those first Chinook and coho eggs from the Western States uh, Railway for stocking into the Great Lakes as a part of uh, Toady and Tanner's project. And landing back here in Alpena is the NOAA Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which interprets a lot of the, the tribal uh, nation, uh, historic, histor historic fisheries of the tribal nations. And then also I, I like that some of our fisheries history lives underwater on the bottom left here is the, the Max uh, Well, which is a commercial fishing uh, tug that fish pond nets and now lives in, in and as part of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So I end here just by saying we have this rich, amazing fishery. Um, I'd encourage you if not only to pick up the Michigan History uh, Magazine and the, the Small Fry Big Catches piece, but also uh, the Life of the Lakes, the, Guide to the Great Lakes Fishery is available through U of M Press in our Michigan Sea Grant bookstore. And then if you just wanna log in and, and poke around a little bit, the Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage Trail is a great uh, way to sort, sift and explore through our Great Lakes Fisheries. And I'll say thank you. And uh, I think um, we may have a few minutes uh, for comments. Don, I'll let you, I'll pass it back to you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. That was really awesome to hear all that. Um, I remember when I first moved up here full time, um, I remember hearing the conversations about the Captain V and the exhibit and, and everything that was going on and I got to kind of check it out. So I, I geeked out because that's my, my background is in maritime archaeology. So um, yeah. anybody that's listening or, or tuning in, in the future, um, that's a really great exhibit to check out. A lot of really awesome information and I, I really do implore you all to check out that Great Lakes Fisheries Trail .org, uh, website and uh, learn more about our Great Lakes um, awesome 
you know, fishing and fisheries heritage. Um, I will, so we have not too many questions. If anyone does have any questions logging in, uh, you know, please submit them as soon as you can. Um, and if any of you are logging in this onto this after um, we've gone live, <clears throat> we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, and I'll do my best to pass those on to Brandon, if, if you're okay with that, Brandon. Um, mm -hmm. The one question we have gotten, and it's kind of one that's kind of popped in my mind a couple of times, you know, here, especially in Alpena and Northeast Michigan, we have the sanctuary, right? So we have a sanctuary location, you know, mainly people will argue that, you know, it's more historical. It's about the shipwrecks and such as well. Um, but, you know, our coastline is, you know, our history of Alpena is that of industry. And like kind of you said, you know, the factories and such and infrastructures built upon those those waterways. So I wondered if you could kind of talk, and also this is one of the questions we've gotten, is kind of, you know, the, the salt pile we have on the river. That's something I get asked all the time. Um, and I know the city gets asked all the time. You know, are there effects of that salt pile being there? Um, and then also in the same vein, uh, you know, DPI and Lafarge, I know we get this question a lot too, because we have some uh, environmental reports uh, that looked into it. How do those kinds of um, organizations and places, how do they play on um, the ecosystems, um, you know, for the fisheries and for fishing in this community? Yeah, and I, I won't speak to any one uh, specifically, but I think the key is that we interact with these water resources in a lot of ways. We drink water, we like to live on the water, and we from a from a industry standpoint or an economic standpoint, we utilize those waterways to ship uh, goods in and out of the region. So, um, no, we interact with this fishery, and I think the real question is asking ourselves, like, how do we do this in a more sustainable way? Which is where I appreciate our our Michigan uh, Sea Grant role is and, and purpose is really to promote Great Lakes science and research. But think about how do we, you know, through education outreach or engagement, how do we do things in more responsible ways, right? So um, it's really hard to say that we should never interact with, with the water or the coastline. That's impossible. But we can ask, how can we do that in more responsible, more sustainable ways? And so I think um, I'm going to uh, shout out maybe to here on Pines and, and some of our, our um, road commissions in Northeast Michigan, really a lot of these like road crossings, anytime we cross a road is potential for us to create a, a barrier in a river system that may prevent species of fish from moving up river into their spawning grounds and there's a lot of reasons for that but but here on pines and um a lot of other research and management agencies and even people who build roads and and bridges our road commissions for example um are working together to say okay if we want to cross this road what are some best management practices that can get us across this road but in a way that maintains the integrity and function of the river so that fish can pass so th so the example would even even velocity so if, if you create a tunnel, like think of the finger over hose and you get too much velocity, you may have fish that can't move up a culvert because the water is moving too fast. But here, the, this collaborative group is saying, if we're gonna cross a road, how do we do that? So we can get across the road, but also maintain that, the integrity of that river so that fish can, can, can use it, for example. And I think those kinds of approaches to any, anything we do are, are, are great conversations to have. Yeah. Um, another question was kind of on this. It's kind of in the same vein, um, you know, with the salt. Salt. Um, I'm from California. We don't salt our roads. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the salting because my brakes rust out on my car a little bit. Uh, because, of, but again, another question is, does salting? And I guess we can kind of use this for the bigger branch of Michigan. Um, if you can kind of talk to it, you know, salting the roads and, and things like that. Is that affecting, uh, you know, our riverways and um, you know, our coastlines and are there conversations of maybe alternatives or something that would be a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, marine biodegradable? I'm not sure what the answer would be that for, the, but is that a conversation um, that your organizations or other organizations you've worked with, um, has that been something that's come up in, in conversation here and there? So, you know, that's a great, great question. And, and um, like in Alpena, I'm not, and I, I'm, may just not be aware of it, but I'm not aware of any of those conversations in Northeast Michigan specific. Um, I do, I do know there's a bot, there's, there's research out there in terms of effects of salting on, on largely like uh, amphibians, for example, frogs mm -hmm. and, um, you know, salamanders and, and so forth. Um, and I think there's, there's also um, some of the un, un, 
some of the consequences you might not anticipate are, are maybe maybe more vegetation related, right? So the salinity can can uh, prefer or or unprefer <laughs> can 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 benefit or it's a win lose winners and losers in salt in terms of the plants that can tolerate that. So vegetation means everything uh, when you think of not just aquatic organisms, uh, insects and and, and animals that live in the water, but also terrestrial animals, thinking of birds that, that leverage or use um, vegetation. So vegetation in say like a wetland context, drive a lot of that 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 foundation of what that ecosystem uh, looks and and feels like in terms of functionality. And so so salinity does 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 have a factor for sure. Awesome. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions just yet. I was just. I, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about the tribal, um, you know, uses of, you know, fisheries, you know, pre-contact and also post-contact, because I was just a part, um, Historical Society of Michigan just had a presentation, I think, last week, uh, where they had um, a representative from the, I'm trying to make sure I remember this right, the Little little Bay of Ottawa in, uh, Indians, I think mm -hmm. it's what that way, yeah, um, and they were just talking about, um, Native Americans in the 20th century and a big a big part of that conversation was the fish you know fishing you know tribal use of, of native fishing spots um, and kind of the the treaties and everything that was involved and you know kind of it seemed like the 70s and 80s were a really pivotal time to kind of mm -hmm. renegotiating like okay you know we have you know for these treaties and legal rights you know getting access to it but also I know for the Little Bay um of ottawa indians their big one was they weren't at the time you know six i think it was 60s you know 50s 60s i i can't remember if it was the 70s or 80s or 90s where their recognition switched and therefore their usage of native fishing locations changed because of that so i thought i definitely thought that was interesting um yeah. you know yeah. you mentioned the tribal stocks yeah you know i i think it's worth noting here that every um corner of michigan is uh, covered by a treaty uh, with uh, tribal tribal nations, and two of those uh, treat tribal nations in two of those treaty areas, the 1836 Treaty of Washington, and then the uh, um, um, 1842 Treaty, which covers the west western area over into Wisconsin and Minnesota. I'm more fuzzy on those boundaries, but but those two treaties um, in their treaties, you know spoke to the importance of water resources and fisheries and, and um, you know, being able to have access to those fisheries. And so remember, I, I noted that there was a lot of, you know, information exchange, technology exchange between the tribes and European during those early exploration steps. And a lot of, you know, the, the commercial fisheries, even up through the sixties were, were, were tribal uh, either subsistence or commercial fisheries. So, the state of Michigan, which regulates uh, fisheries uh, in making a transition from a largely dominated commercial fishery to a um, more of a recreational focused uh, fishery, made a choice of um, buying out or closing down a significant number of commercial operators to reduce number of operators to relieve pressure on fisheries and then creating new access opportunities for rec recreational anglers. And, um, and, and I think What's important is in in that time in those in the, during the 60s and 70s, a lot of those tribal fishery fishers recognized um, their right to fish under their treaties, and that was challenged in courts um, through the 70s. Um, those the federal courts recognized. And I'm, I'm going to speak specifically the 1836 treaty. I'm familiar with that. It recognized those those rights to fish, and um, that really triggered the you know this conversation between the state. And the tribes and the federal government to uh, negotiate um, how they would share that fishery, and and largely the federal courts were saying this needs to be an agreement um, that you all all need to figure out, and so um, that wasn't um, as easy early on. But yeah. with the 2000 consent decree, a 20-year agreement that's just now ending, uh, there was a lot of opportunity um, not just for sharing the fishery, but sharing in the research and management of the fishery. The tribes all have their own. Um, research and management um, or organizations, and and they all contribute. Uh, I mentioned the Great Lakes Fishery Commission umbrella. They all uh, the tribes largely contribute to those collaborative, joint shared fisheries management um, conversations. So, 
uh, the tribal presence, the tribal nation presence in our fisheries is is pretty significant. Awesome. Um, we're just wrapping up. I, I want to ask one more question since we haven't gotten any new ones just yet. Um, everyone sent, sent in their thanks and such, but um, I wanted to ask, you know, for you, you know, as representing, you know, Northeast Michigan, uh, location, you know, when in terms of education and outreach, especially to, you know, younger generations, you know, what I, you know, what kind of programming are you doing, in, you know, in our community here, uh, or maybe some colleagues in different districts, you know, how do you, how do you tell a, a fifth grader or such, you know, how do you educate them about, you know, sustainability and the history of, you know, of fisheries and such as well? Yeah, I mean, so I'll, I'll speak to, um, the Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative, which is a place-based education network and partnership between uh, many schools and many community partners across Northeast Michigan. And really our conversation in, in Michigan Sea Grant is a, a proud uh, leadership partner in that, in, that, in that collaboration, but it's really a really an awesome group of educators and um, community partners saying, how do we engage youth through their learning in environmental stewardship projects that are going to make a difference for Northeast Michigan. So not just me going into a classroom and talking about invasive species, but me really asking how can I have students be a part, work with me in advancing a conversation about invasive species management. And, and so um, Alpena elementary students for many years have been a part of helping to create uh, awareness and outreach on a variety of invasive species from zebra mussels to rusty crayfish. Um, uh, uh, an elementary class at Ella White um, under the uh, guidance of Bob Thompson, an educator, uh, was collecting rusty crayfish data for a Michigan State University researcher who was looking at distribution of different cray spe crayfish species in Michigan. And rusty crayfish is an invasive species. Uh, so, so I think I'm, I'm just going to point to that partnership and say um, really valuing our youth as not just learners, but leaders is is uh, through this place-based education model is something i've been super excited about that's awesome yeah that's very cool so we just hit um just got over the hour mark so we hit it right on the nail you didn't you didn't rush or talk too much i think it was really great and informative i'm i'm happy you could have uh i'm happy that you could join us uh today um and i'm happy that the streaming service we use like i said in the beginning this is the first time we've used this so i was a little nervous it wouldn't go too well, but uh, I'm I'm happy to know that this all came through. I've been getting a text from all the other staff saying, "Hey, you came with you're awesome." So I'm I'm really happy that worked as well. So um, yeah. Brandon, thank you again for joining us, uh, and then hopefully uh, we'll be able to have you again, if not through our uh, the archive department, maybe uh, uh, another uh, component uh, within our other departments as well. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Don, and thank you for everybody uh, to everybody who tuned in to talk fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.